There are a couple of different styles. Actually, resin printing's probably, I think it is the oldest commercially available type of 3D printing um, back in the 80s or so. Uh, well, there's probably been other things that kind of look like 3D printing, um, but this was the first one that was actually probably called 3D printing. Um, and what they used then, and they still use, they're still very expensive, very nice commercial machines that are that fall into this SLA category. So SLA is usually something like selective laser apparatus is what it's normally standing for. And basically you're using a laser beam that's guided around through mirrors or whatever uh, to selectively cure little points of resin. Um, so normally you have, I don't know, some sort of tank of resin in it and somewhere you've got a laser and then there's this little mirror that can be you know controlled and the laser beam is well it's just thinner laser beam than that but um, the laser beam shines and draws the pattern of whatever the cross section is on that vat of laser uh, vat of resin then it goes up a layer and it'll uh, same same process as you do before except it's kind of upside down and cured uh, one little spot at a time through a laser. Um, obviously the laser can actually move really quickly. It basically is limited by how fast can the mirror position itself to shine on a certain spot. Um, but you get really high detail. You get um, super fine resolution on the Z direction and on the uh, X and Y direction, mainly controlled by the uh, size of the laser itself. Um, and there are some of these style printers that use the laser to uh, do SLA type printing that are kind of within the reach of a consumer. Um, you know, you're, you're generally going to be around $4,000 or so as your minimum on one of these style printers. And then they go up, they go way up to a quarter million dollars or so for fancy ones that can do multiple materials curing at the same time and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's, they're really nice, and they're what you see at um, a lot of the, the higher-end prototyping facilities. There are some of these that are, are also uh, in what really is additive manufacturing, where you're actually making parts um, out of this stuff. It's usually the quarter-million-dollar machines or the uh, ones that you lease. You don't actually own it. You just lease it and things like that. Um, so this is still a valid technology, and it's probably the one that is closest to additive manufacturing. Um, it's still generally shorter run parts. You, you know, if you're going to make uh, hundreds of thousands of parts or even tens of thousands of parts, you're probably in a different uh, manufacturing mode, like you want to figure out injection molding for that or something. Um, but if you're in the thousands of parts, then this might make sense. Um, and or if they were really custom parts. Uh, then this makes sense. A lot of different types of resins that you can put in this thing. Uh, some are flexible, some are transparent, some are translucent, some are solid. Uh, some, uh, some of these machines can print multiple at the same time. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of options on the type of resin. Um, generally, these are not something that the consumer is going to go and use in their house, though. Um, like I said, the, the cheapest ones of this style are in the $4,000 range. Um, but somebody then figured out that you could do a similar approach to curing resin, but instead of using a laser beam, use a UV light. So a UV light source can cure resins, uh, certain resins. And if you can just selectively expose the layer to UV light, then uh, you could cure this resin and, and 3D print with it. And so what they decided, figured out, and they're still, you know, these are only two-ish, maybe three years old uh, as options out there. Um, but you take a LCD screen, just the screen, and you can draw on it just like you would send an image to it any other way to show a picture. Um, you can draw a picture, but in this case, the picture is basically a mask. So the LCD screen displays, or I put draws, but displays a mask. So you've got this screen. 
and it and like I say, it's just the screen part. There's no other parts to it, uh, no backlight or that kind of stuff. Well, there is a kind of a backlight down here. You've got, and it doesn't look like this, but you've got a UV light that is shining up through the bottom of this LCD screen. And if you display an image that is, you know, maybe a white or a clear rectangle in a field of black or some color, then the UV light shines through just the opening and cures the resin that is above it. Above this, you have a little tank. These are all smooshed together, and we'll look at them in a second, how they actually are. But this tank has your resin in it, and uh, the wherever the UV light hits the resin, then it cures. It takes, there are different <laughs> amounts of time that it takes. Um, anywhere from there, some I saw this week that can cure in each layer in the two second range by using a black and white LCD screen so it uh, can be more intense. It can more intensely block the uh, UV. Um, but current ones use a RGB LCD screen and it takes maybe eight to 15 seconds to cure a layer. And these layers are super thin. You know, the layers uh, on this little printer, this is the Photon over here uh, and it can Technically, it can go down lower, but in general, it goes down the layer in the range of um, 0 0.01, 0 0.02, maybe 0 0.02 millimeter layer height. I don't normally print that thin, um, but uh, even 0 0.5 or 0 0.1 or whatever is uh, the lower limits for FDM style printing. And that's the upper limits for this kind of printing, the resin UV printing. Um, and you can go down even lower than this technically with the hardware, it just gets more difficult in making your curing times accurate. Um, the other thing that this does, so it, this the LCD version of resin printing has a little bit of an advantage over even the SLA type. The SLA type does have to send this one laser beam all over the bottom. Now it can do it really quickly. Um, and it doesn't take as long to cure because the um, laser beam is pretty intense. Um, and so it doesn't take as long. But the more parts you add to the SLA, it does increase the layer time a little bit. Whereas on the LCD screen, you can have the entire tray loaded up and it takes the exact same amount of time to print an entire tray full of parts as it does to print one part. So it's only controlled by the, the height of the part. Doesn't matter how how wide or uh, long it is, it's it it all gets exposed at the same time, so it doesn't actually matter. Um, so it does have that, and you do have translucent, transparent. Uh, the transparent ones are um, they have a little bit of a problem in that, and the same thing with the SLA is that um, they're difficult to stay transparent. They want to get cloudy just because most resins that cure with UV or light are susceptible to light exposure, so they get yellow over time. There's a couple of things you can do to kind of mitigate that, but in general, they do get a little bit yellow. Um, but there are flexible ones. There are castable resins, so you can cure a part that you later take and do a lost casting process, so lost resin casting process. Um, and so there are some that are specifically formulated to uh, be burned out in a something similar to lost wax casting. Um, both of these, you still run into the situation where you might need support material. Um, the difference is that uh, you're generally printing upside down. So there's normally some kind of platter that comes down and um, you build on top, top of that and that platter raises over time. Uh, and you, but you can still end up with situations where you have to build in support material. Um, I it's not terribly difficult. The slicer does that for you. You do have to think about orientation of where this is going to be. And generally, these slicers do give you more direct control over exactly where the supports are going to be. Um, there is. Let's look at some of the actual parts before we go too far. Here we go. Here's the little printer. Right. Oh, we're upside down. 
There we go. So this is the Photon. It's in the, I don't know, $250 range probably is where you can get it now. Um, it has, a, this one's one of the smaller ones. So the build volume for it is, it's pretty much at the maximum height right now. So uh, the resin would be down in this tank at the bottom and your parts would be hanging from this platter. So that's pretty much the size, maximum size you could print. And even if you did print something that big, you'd probably have to fill up the tank a couple of times um, to be sure you didn't run out of resin in the tank. But this little platter comes off of here and your parts, they basically adhere to this guy <coughs> and it can move up and down. And then in here, this one is where your red, there's no resin in here right now because it's really messy if there is, so uh, it's empty. But there's this thing that has this little FEP, so oh, what's that, fluorinated ethylene propylene. It's, it's similar to Teflon, um, so there's this uh, sheet at the bottom. It's clear. You can kind of see that it's, well, I don't know if you can see that it's clear. Oh, you can see the reflections off of it. So it's similar to Teflon in that it's uh, low friction, so stuff doesn't stick to it horribly badly. Um, it is uh, not reactive with many things or maybe with anything really. Uh, so the resin isn't going to directly interact with it. Um, it's uh, easy material to form into sheets and things like that. Um, and it is highly transparent because this is what down in here, over, over here, this is your LCD screen, and underneath all of this is the UV light array. You can't see it down in there because the screen is covering it all. Um, but they have different, I don't even know what's in this, if it's a single UV or multiple UV lights. But there's an array of UV lights that are shining upwards. And then depending on the pattern that the screen is displaying, some of that UV light shines through onto the bottom of this thing. because It's going to sit right here. And then cure parts of your uh, print. Uh, obviously the little platter is going to go all the way down and be sitting on the uh, FEP sheet. Uh, so that it's a couple of things about these. They're relatively cheap printers, but that FEP sheet, it is a consumable, so you will have to replace it sometime. Uh, and technically even the LCD screen is a consumable. So um, they're not expensive. The sheets are in the you know, $10 range for a pack of them. The LCD screens are pretty cheap. They're in the maybe $40 range for this. The black and white ones are more, but the RGB ones are in the $40 range or something like that. Um, but those are consumables. The Everything I can see says that the LCD screens are going to last. This one I've never had to replace. Um, they're going to last at least 200 hours of printing time up to a thousand hours. So this is really wide range. Maybe there's not enough accurate data out there to really tell you what to expect. Um, but at some point the LCD screen will burn out just because you're shining UV light through it all the time uh, to print. And so it will burn out eventually and you'll have to replace that. Honestly, it's probably with the price of the printers it's probably cheaper in the long run to just get a new printer at that point because they're they're not expensive and they get even less expensive. They're probably pretty close to their lowest price point that they're going to be. Um, and, and you can get them in the $200 price range on sale, maybe $300 for some of the nicer ones. And then they go up, they get bigger, basically start getting bigger or they start having accessories like a wash station. So this is the resin that you're going to get. You can't really see it, but these little box bottles, you get some kind of resin. This is green, um, cures at 405 nanometers, which is in the UV range. Um, and so basically you just have to make sure that it cures somewhere in the 400. I don't remember the exact range that UV exists, that, uh, but 390s to low 400s is the correct range for curing. Um, this is kind of expensive on the uh, material consumable here. Um, typically, normally you get larger bottles. This is the one that came with the printer, so it's a smaller one. Normally you get like a liter for maybe $50, somewhere in that range, depending on what the actual um, 
properties are. If it's just a generic resin, it's going to be in the $50, maybe a little bit cheaper range. Um, but if it's one of the custom, like the flexible or the castable, those can start to get more expensive. Um, so it is expensive, but um, it does last quite a while. There's no waste really other than the support material and whatever little bit you don't let drain back into the vat. Um, I guess you could end up with some waste if you set it out and left the cover open and it cured in the thing. And that would just be a big problem all around. But in normal, I keep this one in a pretty dark room and keep the lid closed and it stays, uh, the resin stays active indefinitely pretty much. Um, I guess if I left it there for years, it would eventually get to where it wouldn't work uh, or maybe it would even harden. Um, Here's the kind of, this is all I could find that I had printed that was handy. So we get to look at some little work guys. Uh, but this is what you're looking at for just the generic quality. This isn't even the high resolution if I can find him. Uh, no, we're focused on the wrong part. But the difference, here's a 3D printed part. So we can... Mike can pick up the layer lines. This guy does have all these little white spots on him. That's where he had support material. And so that's the downside is that the, the support material on FDM printing, generally you can get that set up to where it peels off pretty easily and it's not uh, too hard to deal with. But um, on these, it uh, you can control, basically it comes in, I don't have any support material, but it comes in as a little point and you can tr control the size of that point and the placement on the part. Um, but if you're not careful, which I just threw these guys on there, so they didn't really, I didn't spend a lot of time orienting them correctly um, to only have support in hidden spots. Uh, and so you can end up with this. The good thing is that whereas something like PLA is really difficult to sand and straighten out, um, this is resin, so it sands really easily. Now, you do want to be careful because resin dust, whether it's from 3D printing or any other epoxy casting or whatever, you don't want that dust, uh, you don't want to inhale that, so you do have to make sure that you're not generating this dust everywhere. But it doesn't matter if you print one of these guys or fill up the whole tray with them, it takes the same amount of time, and they all come out generally pretty high. You can't I'm sure that if you found some little spot somewhere, you could find a layer line. But even on the lower settings or thicker layers, low, uh, lower quality settings, it's really hard to pick up where there's a layer line on these things. The uh, Maybe a part that is not as good as FDM. Last time we talked all about the, the issues with printing uh, parts that you want to be a certain size with FDM. It's actually a little harder with the resin um, because not only do you have to have your machine calibrated, which is generally calibrated okay, but you have to have the cure time exactly right. So the layers are cured with this light, and you could imagine, see if we have our resin here. We'll use blue since those guys were blue. and We've got our mask, and we're leaving part of it for the light to shine through. We'll use green for UV light. And that little, whoops, maybe, maybe we're on a couple of layers in, and our platter is up here. So we've got a part of some sort hanging from here that we're currently printing. So this is our part we're printing. Um, if I cure too long... Not only am I going to cure here, but I'm going to start curing deep into the part so I can get parts that aren't the same shape that I intended. Um, or I'll get some bleed over and I'll cure outside, you know, outside of my window, the mask, and I'll get parts that are kind of the wrong shape uh, in the X and Y direction. So it's a little trickier to get parts that are exactly the right dimensions. You can do it. Um, and part of it is orienting the parts in the best way. Part of it, a large part of it, is getting the right cure time. How long do you leave the UV light on to make sure that the layer is cured, but it's not like over curing parts that you don't want cured? 
Um, and so there is some trial and error with a new batch of material to get that cure time right. Most of these, even this little printer, uh, you can go online, just like with your printer, the FDM style printers, you can go online and find a Facebook group or some kind of support group. And generally, every one of these has an Excel sheet with hundreds of resin brands and layer thicknesses and what the what people have generally found as a good cure time for that. So that's generally what I do. I don't normally go and try to figure it out myself. Somebody is pretty much for any combination of resin brand and uh, layer height, they have probably already have a, uh, a recommended cure time for that. Um, infill is different on these. These are solid. These little guys over here, they're totally solid. So there's, there's no hollowness to them. So you, if you want hollow parts, you have to design them to be hollow. So there's not a setting in the slicers that says do 20% infill. Um, what you have to do is you have to go in and make the part you're printing hollow, and then it will print a hollow part and leave the interior empty. Um, you do have to remember to leave a way for the resin to drain out of that hollow part, because if you just, mm -hmm. If you made a sphere like a basketball, then there'd be liquid resin inside of it and it would stay there. It wouldn't doesn't have anywhere to go and it wouldn't be cured. So you'd have this sloshy ball. Uh, so you do have to remember if you're going to make a hollow part to leave some kind of drain hole that you can drain that resin out of later. Um, let's see, what are the things? Uh, right down. Um, I think we talked about most of that. So what you do is w when you get the part printed, um, you, you they're hanging from the, the thing up here, a little platter. They'll, they'll be hanging from that little platter and they're dripping. They've got resin, uncured resin. They are partially cured. They're not totally cured at this point, um, but they're partially cured. They're solid and they've got all this liquid stuff on there. Um, and that's where if you are not a clean neat person you don't want to mess with this stuff because it for one thing if it gets on your skin for most people it's an you know an irritant and for some people it's like a, a caustic so it'll give you chemical burns um, and in general even for people that it's just an irritant continued exposure to this type of resin will make you become allergic to it to where it gives you chemical burns. So you, you don't want to have any way that it's going to get on you. Um, there are two basic styles. One of the resins and most of the resins, in fact, uh, clean up with isopropyl alcohol. So you have to have that handy somewhere. So normally you have to have, what I have is a, a big jar, a big glass jar of IPA. And I put the parts down in there. So I'll scrape them off of the little platter, put them down in the IPA, let them sit for a few seconds, swish them around and then go rinse them off with uh, water at that point. Some resins do uh, have water rinse. Uh, there's not many and they generally cost a little more, but there are some that can rinse with water directly without having to use something like IPA. But um, that, that resin, uh, uncured resin, is really difficult to clean up if you get it places. Um, and it's gonna uh, give you some kind of irritant at least if it gets on you. Um, so you got all this resin everywhere. What I have is I have a baking tray that all of this sits on. And so at least if it gets somewhere, it's on that tray and I can, um, it's the easiest way to actually clean it up is to cure it. So take the whole tray outside, let it sit in the sun, let it cure. And then it, then it's a solid resin again, and you can, uh, scrape it off of there or whatever. It'll just pop off. Um, but the liquid uncured resin is really messy and you really, want to be an overly neat person in order to not create a giant mess with this stuff. Um, so at that point, you've got at least the whatever you're printing, these little guys, they're at least cleaned up and they don't have resin dripping off of them, but they're not cured yet. So they're still a little bit flexible um, and they probably still have the support material on them. Usually at that point, I go and snip off the support material um, sometimes you can peel it off of there, uh, but uh, normally you don't want to do that if, if the parts that they're attached to are really thin. Like 
These guys probably are robust enough that you could just peel the support off of those. You might break something like this little piece over here um, if you're not careful. Um, but I usually cut it off with little snippers and cut the support off of there. And then um, they need to cure and they cure with UV light. So you either put them in a source of UV light, like a box with a bunch of UV LEDs, or you put them outside on a windowsill, somewhere where they can get UV light. Then after, depending on the source of your UV light, if it's a special container that's a curing chamber, then maybe that's uh, 15 minutes as short as. If you put it outside, then it's going to take longer, maybe an hour or two for them to cure totally. And then, you know, there's there's solid chunks of resin. They're brittle still, so they are more brittle than maybe if you printed something out of uh, FDM style printing. But one thing you can do with that is these resins are all generally the same uh, formulation at the base level, and you can mix them together. So you can mix some of this kind of resin that's just, this is green. I think this is actually kind of a translucent green, um, but you can mix in one of the flexible resins and they'll mix together fine. Um, and then your parts have a little bit of give to them. So they're not as brittle like resin normally is, but you can make them more uh, durable if, they, if the part that you're making needs to be able to have more toughness than something that's purely brittle would, would have. Um, and so you can mix the resins together to create a custom blend that will cure as long as they both cure in the same UV wavelength and you don't have some resin that's curing at the, one of the laser uh, wavelengths or something. Um, at that point, then you treat it like you would any other kind of plastic. It's, it's basically a resin at that point and you're, it doesn't ever uncure. Um, I suppose you could heat them up to a high enough temperature to where they would get soft again, but they're not going to go back to liquid resin. Um, I don't think there's a way to dissolve resin into liquid resin that I know of. Um, but in general use, I know it's not going to happen. Um, so it, it's a good material, good process for anytime you need really complicated geometry. If the geometry needs to be, or really fine, fine details, if it needs to be uh, dimensionally accurate, you do have to spend some time going in and calibrating your uh, cure time on per layer so that you're not over curing or under curing your parts and they come out a little uh, misshapen. Um, so you do have to be careful with that. Uh, but in general, um, it's not. Well, I'll say it this way. So it is slower because you're printing thinner layers and each layer is in the, you know, eight second range or so. The newer machine that I saw that will be released, I, can't, I think it's the, no, it's a Frozen um, brand. Um, it's a little bigger and it says that it can cure in the two second range per layer. Um, but again, these layers are really thin, so it takes a lot of layers. But in general, these guys would take um, three, four hours maybe. But the thing is, you can literally, as many as you can stack back to back on the little build platform, still takes three to four hours. Uh, so you do gain a lot of um, throughput. So per part, printing time is actually pretty low. Like you can get down to where you're per part for these guys. You could probably stack them in there and it's 20 minutes apart, something like that. Versus on a, a FDM style printer, if you put... 10 of them, then it's 10 times the amount of printing time as one of them. So you don't gain any economy of scale on the printing time. Um, so you do gain that and you gain resolution. Um, you, you have to deal with as much messier process. And um, there are some of these resins that claim to be eco-friendly and less toxic or tox their toxicity is lower. And uh, I haven't ever tried any of those, but in general, you don't, you want to not have one of these printers in an enclosed space with you just because the, the smell from the resin alone for some people is too much. Um, but the off gases that uh, occur as it's curing or just sitting there even are probably more than most people are going to want to deal with in a small space. So you definitely want it vented. I keep this one in a room that's like it's just a closet. So nobody goes in there. Uh, except to take parts in or out or whatever. So it's not a, not a big deal, but you don't want it like in your dorm room, sitting beside your bed running all the time, because it probably would at the minimum give you a headache and 
who knows what the side effects are from there. But uh, then they are more difficult to deal with on the cleanliness and the, uh, you know, exhaust side than, say, something printing PLA would be. Um, I think that's probably all we need to. Um, I don't, let's see, if I have one of the slicers on here, I don't know if I have one on here. Nope, not there. There's one called, I don't remember what the slicer for that one's called. And I don't, I don't think I'd have it on this printer anyway, or on this computer anyway, because I don't use this computer. Um, basically, the slicers look just like the uh, slicers for an FDM printer, except they have a, you know, generally have a smaller area you're going to put your parts in. You arrange your parts however you want to. Normally, you tilt them a little bit backwards and let the supports all land on the back side of whatever you're printing because they will leave these little nubs where they were connected. Uh, and then you hit slice and you load the file. This one, this one, I use an SD card. I don't know if it has a USB connection. It does have a USB connection. So I guess you know that's, I think that's just for the SD card though. Um, so I don't think you can actually get to these kind of printers um, except through the USB card.